if you're really looking for a fight, you're going to look for like the one word that your partner said that is really, ah, gotcha. And if you're looking for a way to connect, you're going to ignore all those triggers and you're going to find the heart in what your partner is saying. Azul, would you like to join us? Reina is a little below the line. She needs a little therapy. I'm not below the line. I've been staying above the line considering the amount of stuff we've had to do and the amount of travel. I mean, the travel's for work and that's fun, but I think I hit the line today. You're right at it. You're right at it. I'm hovering. You'll get above it. You'll get above it. (laughs) Well, recording always puts me in a good mood. I feel like the show, I mean, I always think it's great, but I've just like loved the last few women we've had on the show. We have an amazing woman this week and it's just been like bangers. Women only. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What do you you know? Uh, Except for you, Azul. Well, let's get into it. Uh, We're going to thank a couple of our partners, and then we're going to jump right in. Thanks to Daily Harvest for supporting Girls Gotta Eat. Daily Harvest keeps us well-fed with easy-to-prep options. Go to dailyharvest.com slash GGE to get up to $65 off your first box. And big shout-out to Helix Sleep. Huge. Enormous. Huge. Changed my life in Ashley's. The way I'm sleeping. Ooh. That's just us. That's not part of the talking points. Take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you the mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash GGE and use the code HELIXPARTNER. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long with Helix. Better sleep starts now. Yes, and thanks to Next Evo for supporting Girls Gotta Eat. Try Next Evo Naturals, capsules, gummies, mints, and topical creams. Get a better start to the year with products like their Triple Action CB Sleep. Go to nextevo.com slash GGE to get 20% off your first order of $40 or more. And thanks to Calm, the number one mental wellness app for supporting Girls Gotta Eat. Reduce stress and anxiety through guided meditations, improve focus with curated music tracks, and rest and recharge with Calm's imaginative sleep stories for all ages. Calm is offering you 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash GGE. I'm hands-free. I'm, it's, it's weird. I don't, I don't know what know. to do with them. So we're recording at Ashley's, which is really nice. Can we just, like, be all comfy on this couch? I hate going to a studio. I can't wait to build ours. If you're watching... The art is here. Should I bring it in the frame? Did you even see it? Wait, why do I feel like I saw it? Where is well, it? It's right there. <laughs> you thought somebody walked in. Let me get it. I just want to show the YouTube. I'm having my mounting guy come and do some stuff, but this is the <laughs> photo. <laughs> I'm behind it, just so you guys know. It's so on brand. I love it. I think it's really unique and beautiful. Also, is it the same guy that's been doing work at my house? No. I have so many updates for everybody today. I'm so excited. I have a neighbor update. I have a art gallery update. I have a house update. We just have so much going on. I have a different mounting guy. His name is Igor. You have a different (laughs) mounting? Should I use your kind of mount? I don't know. I just... Your task rabbit to build furniture is unparalleled. He's incredible. Yeah, I might have him. Have you had him mount yet? I have not had him mount, but I had him hang a chandelier and all my string lights outside. No, he's great. I just... So you had him mount yet. I do need some things mounted. Yeah. I mean, you, use him. If they say they mount, they do mount. But <laughs> it's not for everybody. Some of them don't mount. Mounting is hard because you're drilling into a wall. Like, remember when Dylan, I tried to have him mount one floating shelf that was three pounds? Yeah. I will never... That, that's the biggest hole I've ever seen in a wall. Dylan. It's so crazy. He's a friend of ours. He's a comedian. He's been on the show and he looks like he would be really capable. He is not. Rob was so upset. He was like, (laughs) we need to teach him some life skills. But Igor did the TV and then I just really liked his crazy laser level thing. So (laughs) that picture can hang there. I can do it myself. I just need him to do the level for me. So he's coming tomorrow. So I'm like, I'm just going to wait. And then I have like floating shelves and we're really getting there. I can't recommend paying someone else to help you with this stuff enough. Well, I'm, I can't do it. I can't, like, I mean, guy friends and stuff, like, Rob yeah. would have mounted that TV in 12 seconds, but he wasn't in town. And so I'm like, yeah, I can't mount a TV. It's so funny. You know what I mean? It's like I'm a feminist, except for when it comes to, like, what is it, like, paying for the check or something. <laughs> I'm a feminist, except for when it comes to, like, things around my house. Like, I'm all good. I'm just going to pay people to come help me unpack, mount, hang things. Like, yesterday, I was like, I'm just going to take all the boxes out to the street. And there was, like, 
30 to 35 boxes. And it took me hours, actually. It took me two hours to break every box down, to break it out, yeah. like stack them in a way that's not like a huge asshole for the neighborhood. And I was like, where have two hours gone? I'm, I know. I'm never going to do it again. Time is money. I mean, I will do, I'll do a lot. I will do a lot, a lot. And like, you know, I used to do it all. I didn't have <laughs> money to pay people. Those apps didn't even exist. You know, like right. I've always just hung all my stuff, done all my own stuff, like tried to get people to help me. But yeah, now it's nice to be able to be like, do, 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 get in the app. Yeah, some stuff I'm also not strong Find enough. a hot guy. Get him to come over. You watch him build <sighs> stuff. I can't recommend using TaskRabbit as a dating app enough. So I said this thing to Ashley yesterday, and it applies to TaskRabbit too. Like, in LA, like, I, the thing that's, like, one of the biggest changes for me is, like, all the places that used to be, like, my safe space full of, like, dog shit, like the grocery store, the doctor's office, where I would just roll up looking so bad are no longer safe to look like dog shit. And TaskRabbit stuff is the same too. Like, everybody is hot. I look yeah. so ugly at home. The TaskRabbit shows up. He's so hot. I went to the eye doctor yesterday. He was a 10 smoke, so hot. I go to the grocery store. Everyone's hot. Where can I go to look ugly here? I know. <laughs> like, where can you go? What is safe? <laughs> What's safe? Probably Skid Row. <laughs> I bet you even they're hot there. Everybody's hot. Uh, well, we promised you guys uh, that we would announce new dates for the fall and the winter. We are so excited. So without further ado, we're not going to tease this any anymore. longer. We have tons of dates. We're really excited. Snack City Tours. So there's eight shows left right now of the current tour. So please get those tickets. And then we will see you in the fall. Do you want to kick it off? Okay. I feel really excited about this Oh, my gosh. One. You guys, we are coming to the UK. Burr, 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 burr. First show in London ever in Girls Gotta Eat history. I can't even believe it. September 9th, 9 9, very easy to remember, at the Indigo at the O2. Is that my, what we say? Yeah, my brother and my sister in law who are living there now went and they were just, they took a picture outside. They were like, I can't wait to see you here. I was so excited. I yes. can't wait. In. First ever London show. <laughs> uh, I can't believe it. Get those tickets. I have a feeling they're going to go quick. You guys have been begging us to come for literally four ish years. <laughs> yeah, so. We've been trying. Yeah, we really did. This was on the books pre-COVID. We tried to do it. It's just whatever. Like, we're finally making it happen, but it's always been something that we've been wanting to do. And then we are coming back to Texas on Thursday, September 28th, Austin, again at the Paramount Bomb Theater. We love it. Then the next night, Friday, September 29th, we are in Dallas at the Majestic again. <laughs> that show, holy shit, <laughs> unhinged. <laughs> The stripper hit me the with a Dal belt, Ashley. The, the Dallas last time was one of those times where I was like, I don't know what's happening. I haven't looked down at my outline in an hour. People were standing in the aisle. Remember, it was just like people were just like in, not in their seats. Like, I mean, it's Texas, so no rules. Uh, Dallas business car guy came up oh, and like right. choked me and was like spinning me around. And then he does like teach some classes. It's like not his like main thing, but like some of his students, oh, students were there, were, like yes. in the audience. Dallas business car guy. Oh my god, totally forgot. That's the origin story. Friday, October thirteenth, Charlotte at the Fillmore, and <laughs> finally coming back to Atlanta, October fourteenth at the Buckhead Theater. I'm so excited to play there. I used to throw parties there. I had so many New Year's Eve, Halloween parties. I worked with this social group called A Social Mess, and we threw all these parties. And so I have just been up in there so much, partying so hard, so wasted. And so it's funny that we're performing there. But I'm really excited we could reschedule that show for you guys on October 14th. Sunday, October 15th, we will be in Nashville, finally coming back to Nashville, Tennessee Performing Arts Center. And then Thursday, October 26th, we're in Portland at the Newmark Theater. So that's different than yeah, what we, we did before. We really yeah. wanted to like do something different. Yes. And then the very next night, we'll be in Vancouver, October 27th at the Vogue Theater. Then we're heading to Seattle, October 28th, the Moore Theater. San Francisco, November 3rd, the Masonic. Los Angeles, we'll be at the Ace ah. Theater. Um, so we're coming back home for a show November 4th. And then right back out again to San Diego, November 8th at the Balboa Theater. And then we are rounding out the year. So it's special. I like feel like I'm going to cry. Our holiday shows. Toronto, we will be there oh! December 8th. We're doing it like emotional oh, holiday this. show in Canada. We're really doing it. <laughs> we're really excited. It's really one of our like biggest markets. We're so excited. And then New York, we're going to, why am I crying? We're ending the tour, the Snack City tour in New York City at the Beacon Theater. So it's, why am I good? Yeah, We've announced good. so many tours on this show. But we will list all this on our Instagram. All of the dates are going to be on the website now. The links will not work if you click them. It'll say the show's not on sale yet. So all shows go on sale April 17th, 10 a.m. local time. Okay. So, so 
all of this is gonna be on our website so you guys can just plan for it and go ahead and like get ready to get into the queue. But all of this will actually be on sale April 17th in the morning, 10 a.m. your local times. Yes. Oh my gosh, I cannot wait. And we will see you guys out there. Yeah, we're out so excited. Road. We've been trying to like make up these shows in Atlanta, Nashville, and Charlotte for so long. So we're really so amped. And then we just got back from the most fun weekend in Milwaukee yeah. and Minneapolis. Yes, we had the best time in Milwaukee and Minneapolis. That was our sixth sold out show in Minneapolis over the years. And our first time in Milwaukee, Cream City, <laughs> which one girl messaged, she didn't like our jokes about Cream City. Girl, what are you talking about? All they did was make dirty Cream City jokes. Bitch, if you didn't think we were coming to a city called Cream City and that would be the story arc of the whole show, you don't know us at all. Also, it was dirty jokes. What did you think was going to happen in that room? We have not made it clear enough that these are filthy, dirty shows. (laughs) Anyway, we really loved Milwaukee. We stayed at this great hotel, the Iron Horse, and had such a good time in Minneapolis, goes without saying. So thank you guys for coming out. We really, truly had the absolute best time, and these shows just keep getting wild and crazier. We added a whole new element (laughs) of this last tour in Minneapolis that we tested out, so that's going to be integrated into all the shows going so forward. It was like the funniest thing because me you and Tessa were like in the airport together and we were like brainstorming and I feel like Tessa had this idea and then you and I at the same time said the exact same thing. All three of us conceptualized this like really fun thing. So yeah. we're really excited to do this with the shows with you guys. I just have to say this thing. So I think it was our first flight out. We had a layover in Denver mm-hmm. and I was sitting next to this man and he was fine, whatever. He got on the plane. He was on a call, being all loud, whatever. But then he just kind of, I was in and out of sleep. I fall asleep as soon as the plane takes off and I'm just like asleep the whole time. So I'm in and out of sleep and I hear him ordering drinks, whatnot, you know, <laughs> I'm fading in and out. You know, you always have turbulence going over the mountains in Denver. So we're about to land in Denver, really shaky, turbulent. It's the most turbulence you'll ever feel. It's a lot of it's turbulence. Lot. It's just kind of what it is. He doesn't wake up. When I tell you, I'm not afraid to fly anymore. Like I've like done a lot to get there. Like I'm not afraid of turbulence. This was extreme. I can't. Uh, it was extreme turbulence. Yeah. So the turbulence woke me. Or maybe I was already up. Whatever. It was significant. And then we landed. <laughs> and this kid in front of us is screaming. Like we're the plane you, dropped. I mean, onto if the you know runway. what it's like to fly and the way a plane lands, like he did not wake just, up. I'm like, this is unreal. Like. If you don't wake up when the plane lands, that is a jolt to the system. I was like, this is shocking. So I'm like, what is going on? And he stays asleep the whole time. We're ready to get off the plane. People are getting up. They're getting their bags. I'm in the window seat, obviously, so I can control what's happening with my window shade. And I'm like, I have to wake this motherfucker up. I, to get out. It is really so funny. I kept, you texted me, this guy's still asleep. I'm looking at him. Everybody in the plane is standing up, unlatching the things to get all their suitcases down. Suitcases are hitting the ground. And this I'm, guy's just asleep. And I'm trapped. I can't get out. He's man spreading while he's sleeping. And so I just like tap him. The way he looked at me, that man did not know where he was. He was so wasted. And then I like had this memory of as I was falling asleep, him ordering like double doers on the rocks. Like I was like, oh, he is fucked up. And (laughs) he looked at me so confused. And I was like, I don't know what to say to him. I have to get out. I have to like (laughs) deplane. And he was just like, ooh, like, and he finally just gathered himself and like, let me just moved his legs a little bit. He still could not stand. He just moved his legs so I could shimmy out and get my bag. I was like, that man is not well. I was like, Raina, that guy was blacked out. I was like, what in the afternoon? To la- yes, exactly. Like to land and be like, where am I? That is, I'm, have you ever been that drunk on a plane? I don't want to drink on a plane. I'll have like one drink maybe. I've never gotten like drunk on a plane. This is mm-hmm. not my vibe. I have all the respect in the world for people that get on a plane at 7 a.m. and start ordering liquor. Respect. Live your truth. I'm just looking at it like, how did this happen? How did we get here? I love when I go to the Delta Lounge. It's like 7 in the morning and somebody has two drinks in front of them. Yeah. I'm like, what are you doing today? <laughs> like, I have so many questions about your afternoon. I mean, some people just view the travel experience as drinking related. Like, that's party time. So I feel like that's, you know it when you see it. Like I'm usually 
in the minority not ordering a drink. Well, my bounce back is different than most people's. I mean, you know me. I have one drink. I stopped drinking. I have a hangover, which is instant. So, like, a lot of people, most of my friends can, like, have two drinks of lunch and, like, go on with their day. I cannot. Yeah. Yeah. I just, with the altitude, like, it doesn't really go well for me. I feel, like, instantly more dehydrated. But, yeah, usually if I'm, like, also if I'm flying in, like, a, a long flight, a lay flat, I like to get a glass of wine and, like, watch a movie. Like, that's luxurious. You know, I remember a couple years ago when my dad had that fake stroke and then I was having, like, a psychotic meltdown and I flew to Pittsburgh and I started drinking at the airport at like two in the afternoon. I had like two to three drinks in the airport and then I got on the plane and they gave me two more drinks. I was blacked out drunk. It's the drunkest I've ever been at an airport oh on an airplane and the flight attendant comes over to me and she was like, I didn't want to bother you, but I was like, no, no, no. She was like, we are all such fans of your show. And I was oh like, God. I can't talk to a person right now. I'm so drunk. <laughs> That's so funny. And then I just want to give one more update. My nails, I'm really feeling them. Last week I said, I'm not trying to get used to them. They're an inconvenience. And you really do just get used to them. You do. The thing is like, when you get these, you just don't realize how strong they are because you're doing stuff that if your natural nails were this long, they would just break. You know what I'm saying? So I think you have to adjust to be like, these are strong and they can, you know, pull your leggings up and not break. Oh yeah. Well, these are specifically. And like everything is, I've figured it out. Typing, I'm still a little slowed down, but yeah, the nail tech was right. She was like, give it three days and you'll adjust. And I obviously have loved the way they look from the start, but so many of you guys message me and people are like, you should do SNS and set a gel. And I just, I like the way these look for now. And I, I think I'm committed to sticking with this for a little bit, but I appreciate everyone that like sent me <laughs> messages about my nail journey. <laughs> it's a big deal. I'm telling you, like I was the first thing on my notes last week was talk about Ashley's nails. It's a big deal. <laughs> Okay. I need new ones. I'm do- I think I'm doing cat eye. I think I'm doing velvet nails next. Just, that's a whole nother. That takes longer. Not that much longer. I love my place. But I, I do love these green nails. I get a lot of compliments. Everybody at Orby Parker yesterday said how nice my nails looked. I got new glasses. Oh, I got yeah. new eye exam. He said that my prescription has not changed that much. I have okay. astigmatism, but it hasn't changed that much. But you and Tessa pointed out that I am driving now, so I should get a stronger prescription. Uh, yeah. I have two updates for you. Okay. The first is about my neighbor. Tessa really undersold this. <laughs> Couldn't have undersold it more. I went over last week. Listen, I know I said I'm not going to sleep with him, and I'm probably not, but I will. That guy. Dibs. So <laughs> He's so hot. <laughs> it's great. Tessa really undersold this. Well, so yeah. I like, popped over there to be like, hey, I just want to introduce myself. Sometimes my packages will come to your door or whatever. I walked in there and this like six foot two man with no shirt on that was sweating and working oh out was there. And I was like, what the fuck? He is. And he's like scrambling to find a shirt and apologizing to me for not having a shirt. And I'm like, don't put it on. Don't put it on. He was so hot. So nice. And he like texted me and was like, let me know if I can do anything to help. And I was like, you could just come drink with me and he was like all right yeah and listen he does have a hot brother that looks almost exactly like him so i think the move is the brother okay is the brother older or younger unclear okay i only stalked the current guy yeah rob and i came over and i spotted him he lives in like the same house as you almost same address right like it's really close so the owners like i guess took this house put a wall up and it is the same address yeah so like one address is on the street one's on the avenue but it's like the same building essentially it's weird yeah i caught a glimpse i was like oh and then i went to his instagram i was like jesus fuck (laughs) so yeah we'll see someone will fuck him someone in this group will fuck him (laughs) he actually or tessa Tessa. Tess is like, he's a little old for me. <laughs> he's 28. She's like, ew. <laughs> so that's my update about that. And then my other update is about the art gallery with Rusty. And <laughs> Rusty. They, did, they did wear me down. I have bought new stuff from them. They started but calling wait. me and texting me every but, like, day. You didn't go there, right? I'm going there this week. You're going, okay, to pick up your stuff? Pick up my stuff. And there's like this other thing I want to look at. But he also... <sighs> It's so unlike me. He, he was like, Rusty, let me know, blah, blah, blah. It's so unlike me to not be like, Rusty should deliver the stuff that I bought. Like, yeah. I'll pay you guys more if you just get this guy to deliver. Like, why not be bold? And I'm disappointed in myself that I didn't yeah. like, say, like, only if Rusty delivers it. Because when the owner called, he brought Rusty up too. Yes, and he, he was brought- like, you talked to Rusty. So you already have the opening to say, can he deliver it? It's a missed opportunity. I'm really disappointed in myself. Do you guys deliver? Does Rusty deliver? Does Rusty specifically? deliver? <laughs> yeah. Can Rusty be my delivery driver? I still think I could do it. Yeah. Maybe I'll just see. I'll be like, I don't have time to drive out there. Can Rusty come by? Yeah. Yeah. He's going to be like, ma'am, he has his own job. <laughs> ma'am, he has a wife. <laughs> just <Ew. laughs> Okay, let's take a quick break. And then I'm going to tell you guys about my car. Oh, so Yay. exciting. 
Okay, so I am telling you guys about Next Evo. This is CBD that we love. So we love it. A study by an independent lab confirmed some brands contain up to 60% less CBD than they claim on the label. That's crazy. But with Next Evo Naturals, you can trust you're getting the best of the best. And this is the most clinically studied CBD brand on the market. They take research to the next level. We love that. We love research-based uh, anything. So I really love this. I have taken the triple action sleep and I have done the gum and I'm just such a fan. Their technology is this smart sorb CBD. It's proven to have 30 times better absorption in the first 30 minutes and four times the overall absorption as other products. It works. I mean, I know people are like, does CBD work or not? Like I can tell you this does. I can tell you that triple action sleep will just relax you, possibly knock you right out. You can get capsules, gummies, powders, whichever you prefer. And again, you're going to get better sleep, wake up feeling more refreshed, have more peace of mind, or you can ease your post-workout soreness. So they have all kinds of products, whatever you guys are into, stress release, better sleep, or boost your daily wellness. Again, CBD is not just for helping you fall asleep at night. It can be throughout the day and ease your stress. And I like that they say the post-workout as well. So the stress CBD complex, smart sorb CBD, and whole plant ashwagandha, clinically proven to reduce stress by up to 70% and improve concentration by 50% too. So great to take during your workday. And again, the triple action CBD sleep, smart sorb CBD to calm your mind, fast acting melatonin to get you to sleep fast and controlled release melatonin. So you sleep longer and wake up refreshed. I love the controlled release too. So it's not just like you're going to fall asleep and then be waking up and tossing and turning all night. So we really want you guys to check out Next Evo. I am such a fan. I use it. We stand by it. So you can upgrade your CBD, go to nextevo.com slash GGE to get 20% off your first order of $40 or more. That's 20% off $40 or more at nextevo.com slash GGE. All right. I'm very excited to have this partner and that is Helix mattresses and literally everything that they do is it's my whole house. Just go to helixsleep.com slash GGE and take their two minute sleep quiz and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. I... I'm loving these mattresses. I have the Helix Dusk. I don't like something too firm or too soft. It's like right up the middle mm -hmm. for me, which I really like. I also have their platform. I have their plush mattress topper. I just love these mattresses. I wake up feeling really good. Like my body feels good. It's not like too hot or too cold. It's just like the perfect temperature. You can go to their website. You'll take a quiz and it'll just ask you like, are you a couple? Are you single? Like, where do you like to sleep on your back, on your front, on your side? And they'll make recommendations based on all this for you. And that's all I did. I just took the quiz online. They sent me that. They sent it in a box. You just literally unroll it on top of your bed frame. I got a bed frame from them as well. And it just all went perfectly. It's so comfortable. If you're looking for a mattress, take the the quiz. You will not regret it. I'm just obsessed with it. And Ashley and her family have been sleeping on these for years. And I'm just so, so happy with what I got. They have a 10 to 15 year warranty and you can try it out for a hundred nights risk-free and they'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you absolutely will. Yes. In my guest room, I have the midnight which I love because I'm a Moonlight Lux girl, but I got the Midnight, not the Lux, which both are great. The Lux just means there's like another layer. You'll look online and you'll see, but get the Lux or not, whatever you guys are into, but I have both now. So I have the Moonlight Lux and I have the Midnight Regular and I just love both. Like I'll sleep in there sometimes because I'm just like a different little bit firmer vibe mm -hmm. and I love all of it. So yeah, whatever you guys are into, they have the perfect mattress for you. I fall right asleep. Yeah. It's really been so nice. My first king. I just love it so much. Mm -hmm. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. You got to get the pillows. They're fantastic. Oh, yeah. Go to helixsleep.com slash GGE and use the code Helix Partner. This is their best offer yet and it won't last long with Helix. Better sleep starts now. Okay. okay. So you had a very big moment this week, a really <laughs> special moment. Well, let's talk about it. I bought a car. <laughs> I told you, you guys the, I was. The car. The car, my dream car. I bought a Jaguar F Pace, six cylinder, 400 horsepower. You lost me on one of those words. I don't. <laughs> do you know what those words mean? Yes, <laughs> of course I do. <laughs> my dad drives an eight cylinder Jaguar sedan. So that car has some juice in it and like it just has such pickup and my dad ha is a big Jaguar Land Rover guy when I was like growing up he 
always had these like old cars and like, you know, you're just this dumb kid. You're like embarrassed. You just want your head parents have like a new car. Like yes. he had this like bright orange car. I was like, don't pick me up at school That's in cool it. I was dope. like, I'm, it, but now I'm like, that is the dopest car. But back then, and then I remember he got this old Jaguar and I for once thought it was cool. And that was like the first thing I thought it was cool. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you just think your parents are like embarrassing. And yeah, I just remember thinking it was cool. And then I just think ever since then, you know, this old friend of mine DM'd me and we were friends in middle school. And she was like, I remember you saying in middle school that you wanted a Jaguar and you really did it. And it was really special. And I just want to make my dad proud. You know, my dad's a car guy. His whole life has been all about cars. That was his business forever. He owned an auto parts supplier. And it's just like... I just wanted a car that he would be like, I can't wait to drive it. I wanted something that he would be proud of me for. Mm -hmm. And it's what I wanted. And I bought it with my own money. And my best guy friend, Rob, I couldn't have done it without him. Couldn't have done it without a man. I can't do anything Um, without Rob. (laughs) I mean, I could have, but like he helped me kind of figure out what I wanted in advance. And then it changed when I test drove the one with the red interior. (laughs) So I knew I wanted white and I just wasn't thinking red interior. I'm like, that's so loud. And then that's the one we test drove on the lot. I was like, this is it. This is the car. Like we were going to try to find a different one. I was like, no, no, this is the one I want today. I want to buy this today. I'm not leaving till this is mine. I like the wheels. I like the red. I feel like a rapper. Like I just really want it. So we took the one off the lot and I went and picked up a couple days later because we were like on tour and I had to get insurance and so that's a whole thing. But yeah, I mean, Rob was so wonderful. He knows so much about cars. It was so nice to have him because my dad couldn't be here or Matt couldn't be here. So I'm just, you know, eternally grateful to him for everything that he does and his wife for letting <laughs> us borrow him all the time. <laughs> He's helping us build out the studio. And so he literally has like, we're his like other wives slash daughters. <laughs> like that's really the crazy. Vibe. We were on a phone call and we like hung up and he's like, so what I'm hearing here is there's a stop gap, there's a bottleneck, blah, blah, blah. And here's ways to address that. And we're like, are you also our business manager? This is crazy. Yeah. So he helped me and they were great. I got a Jaguar Los Angeles and this was huge for me. You know, I've been wanting to buy a house. I haven't been able to do it. I, I've never bought my own car. You know, I had my same car since like, I've college. We all know the 03 Xterra, which is still around, is on the farm. There's no trade-in value and that's fucking <laughs> thing. We're going to keep that. That'll be Jay's first car. Aww, <laughs> Can you yeah. imagine? They're like, that's not safe. That's not safe. He's like, it's vintage. There. It was really nice. And like, we went to pick it up Sunday. Tessa dropped me and you off right as soon as we landed. I went to go pick it up and we pulled up and then through the window, like this little glass room at the dealership, I look in and I see the white Jaguar F-Pace with a big red bow on it. I was like, oh my God, that's it. Is that really it? And it's so- also like in its own little room because you just drive it out of there. So it's like in a box by itself. It's yeah. just like so special. Yeah. So it was like really so nice. I just wanted like a nice experience for it. So you don't need a man to buy you your dream car, ladies. <laughs> just follow your dreams. <laughs> and really... that's what it is. So I'm driving all the time. Like I'm like, I'll drive, I'll drive, I'll drive. I'm just like, this is going to make me sober because I'm never going <laughs> to drink and drive it. And so, and I want to drive all the time. Like I want to be in the car and mm-hmm. pick people up. And, you know, Kate and I were going to this thing in Santa Monica tonight. I was like, I'll drive. Like I'm just going to be that bitch. So take advantage while you can, friends. <laughs> of you? Yeah. <laughs> like while I'm wanting to drive so much. Um, it is really special. It's like such a crazy thing because like New Yorkers, we don't like own anything. You know, yeah. like we don't have these moments that like everybody else has in their like early adulthood, like buy a house, buy a car. Like it, it's just you don't need those things there. And so it takes a little longer. And it's just it's funny that like I'm in my 30s. I've never like really owned anything. <laughs> and it is really like so special to have those moments where you're like, I did this thing for myself. Mm -hmm. Because I just, I don't know, in New York, you don't really have a lot of those. Yeah. It's really, really nice and exciting. Yeah. So I'm excited. I wanted to talk about this thing that I was watching Curb Your Enthusiasm of all things. And it it. like jogged my memory about this like dating topic I wanted to like ask your opinion on. So the episode, season nine, and he's talking to a friend of his who like called this person that he's dating Honey. Mm-hmm. And then she gets like really weird and Larry's like, you premature honeyed. Like it was the premature honey. And I had this guy who told me I babed too soon. Yeah. And I just, it made me laugh so hard and just thinking about like, how do you like come back from that and how soon is too soon for like pet names? Because I think these people were like on like a third date. So I wanted your like take on like how soon is too soon to like drop a honey or a babe. Um, I, honey is just like married couple in my eyes. Mm-hmm. Honey. Honey, I use honey. I, I don't use it. It's fine. Like whatever. It's, I don't. I don't think anyone's ever called me that. I don't think I've ever said honey. It just. It feels like kind of like your parents. Like it just feels kind of old timey to mm-hmm. me. But like whatever. Like live your truth. I don't know. Like that's just. 
I had an ex that just like started calling me a pet name like really early, kind of jokingly, but then it stuck. Like I'm talking like week one. So yeah, like sometimes those things happen like that. Like I remember one ex of mine, I babed him first, but we'd been together for a while Mm -hmm. and he was like, babe, huh? And I was like, shut up. Don't shame me. We're together. (laughs) We've been together for like months on months on months. Like, and so then he just started calling me it and that was like our transition into it. Like, it's funny when you do it the first time and like, A, someone calls you out (laughs) or or, like they don't reciprocate it. You're like, it really is putting yourself out there. It really is. It's scary. The first time you drop a babe. Yes. (laughs) Well. I was like drinking and like, I must have said like, what time do you want me to come over, babe? I was saying it like sarcastic. It was so soon in the relationship. He couldn't have thought (laughs) that I was serious, but he like, and when I say relationship, I have huge air quotes. Like we had fucked after going to the bar. We'd purposely gone on dates, like three maybe. And then I had said like, babe. And I think he really like took it. You know, all men are like, she called me babe. She's in love with me. You know, he didn't like it. He was like really turned off by it. He told me I babed too soon. Yeah. But I meant it as like a joke, but you got to be careful for the babe lane minds. And I think (laughs) that like, if it's a unique nickname, that's like a joke between the two of you, something that's not like babe, baby, honey, if it's a little unique to the two of you, you can use that sooner because it's funny. Yeah. That's kind of what my my experience was. It was just kind of something like pop culture-y. And then we just ran with it and used it all the time. But I'm wondering, do people ever test it out via text first? (laughs) Do you type it before you say it? This is like a real thing. And maybe like there's a transition of like, for me, you know, you're calling me Ash first. Like it's a nickname start and then pet names, right? Like, I don't know. Like, do you guys ever call you Ray or... Ray Ray. (laughs) Yeah, I get Ray. It feels overly familiar. But do you like it when you're into somebody? Like a guy that I'm dating or or just like that does an Ash, I'm like, ooh, like chills up my spine. I love it. Ray Ray. I get that sometimes. It feels playful and flirty, so I like that. Babe, to me, like that word means we're in a relationship. (laughs) Like... Ray, 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 Bay. Like those things feel like playful and flirty. Babe feels like it comes with like a collar, like around your neck, like you're in a relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do Bay. I've done that like more playfully, but then it sticks, you know. But babe, yeah, it means something. Babe and baby means like I feel that I have ownership over you. Baby, nope, 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 nope. Baby girl, like, I can't. <laughs> I mean, some guys can pull it off, don't get it twisted, but like, I'm, I hear like, baby, I'm like, don't do it, don't do it. And then I had an ex that we both just really like loved Dewey and RIP King, and he just started calling me all my pet names to Dewey. So all the like little things I called Dewey, he just started calling me that. That's he would funny. use my dog voice. That's funny. But I gotta tell you, speaking of Dewey, so I've got this alarm system installed. And I'm speaking of, like first, I've never had one. And they were like, what do you want your safe word to be? <laughs> Dewey? The first thing that came to mind was Dewey. That's and I, so funny. I thought it'd be too easy to guess that like I like might have used it. Yeah, but Dewey is here. Remember the orange? Dewey lives in California. Dewey is here. He was in the Soho house <laughs> with us that night. <laughs> if you know, you know. He knocked an orange off the bar and then it disappeared. He is here. He's in California. He's been here for a minute. I just thought so it he was- popped into your head because he was probably in your he was probably checking up on you. First word that came to mind before anything else, Dewey came to mind. Somebody else's animal. Also if you're new around here, Dewey is my dead dog. <laughs> <laughs> you're around here. And we had a situation in this hotel where he was role. there. Yes. In Ghost. He yeah. was a ghost. Um, it, just, it really made me laugh at that. I was like, why is this the first thing that I thought That is of? so funny. That's your safe word. Oh my, my safe gosh. word is Dewey. Azul is a funny safe word. I, he was the second. I was like, <laughs> is Azul weird? And I picked something else because I feel like it's too easy to guess. I'll tell you what it was later. If you could guess what it was. Okay. But anyways, it made me laugh. Anyways, pre- premature honey. I just thought it was very funny. Honey, I'm curious of what our listeners, we should do a like Instagram question slide about pet names. Like, and weird pet names and funny secret pet names, you know, like it's funny when people have something that is a little more obscure because, and then you're around it and you feel like you're seeing them naked. When you see couples use their like secret Bubba. weird, <laughs> it makes my whole body. Wait, what? <laughs> Bubba? Bubba. Like my like little Bubba. Like you've never heard that? It gives me I, the ick all over my body. <laughs> well, Bubba to me is more like what you call your kid. I feel like my friends might call their little son that, Bubba. No, that's B-U-B-B-A. What are like, you saying? Like, 
I guess it could be the same. What are you saying? Say I'm Bubba. It. Like, it's just, yeah, I'm, I, I've never called anybody that, but like, I've heard other people do it and it gives me like full body ick. Also, do you feel like sometimes like people like to overuse babe? It's like Lindsay thing. Hubbard and Carl? Do I think every word out of their mouth? Hey, babe, what's babe, up, babe? babe? Thanks for getting my suitcase, babe. It's, <laughs> to me, it's the same energy as someone that's like my boyfriend, like someone that you can't, it's almost, it's giving like my first relationship vibes a little bit when you, it's like, like so much extra. And this isn't everyone's story, but like when I feel like it's an overusage of pet names, it can be a little try hard. It just feels, it feels forced to me and like try hard. Like you're just, you got to let everybody in the room know that you're in a relationship. Hey babe, what's up babe? I love you babe. What's going on babe? Listen, I think it's sweet, but like there's a line. I can't describe it. You just know when someone's crossed it. It's just too much. And it's, it is Summer House Lindsay and Carl. Every single sentence is, has the word babe in it. And it feels weird. Also, what about when people just always say my husband or my wife? I like, you were going to say that. Say Kevin. Say Angela. Like, just say their name. Like, I know who they are. Like, I can't even imagine, like, if Kate said my husband ever instead of Jay. It's really, really. Or Matt said my wife. Like, you know, it's like a little dated. It's a little, like, Southern. It's a little patriarchal to me. Or it's a things. little bit, like, or maybe not. Maybe it's just, like, you're so obsessed with, like, marriage. I mean, I know a man in particular that does it all the time, and it, like, doesn't bother me when he does it. I think he's, like, obsessed with his wife and, yeah. like, doesn't think he's, like, better than anybody because he's married. I mean, he just – he says my wife a lot. But, like, it is – outside of him, it is sort of odd to me when, like, I know your partner. I've hung out with them. You yes. can just say their name to me. Right. Like, it's different strangers. Yeah, of course. My wife, my husband. But, like – Like, what are we trying <laughs> to do here? With, with your close circle – and, again, guys, it's just our opinions. If you do this, I don't give I a don't fuck. Care. But it's just funny. I think about, like – Kate or Corey, for example. If Corey or Kate said my husband, I'd be like, stop it. It just I was at the wedding. Just say their name. I'll spend a hundred times with them. It sometimes it just feels like somebody's trying to put you in your place to let you know that like they they're have a little one. Bit better, yeah. You're they're a little bit better than you. They're on a different level. My fiance. Mm, my fiance. Uh, Which I get it. You if you just newly got engaged, you can't say it enough. And I respect it. Actually, when I was fiancéed, for those like four months I was fiancéed, it was hard for me to say it. It was just, it feels so like weird coming out of your mouth. Actually, he's my fiancé. Because like, it's not your boyfriend anymore. I need people to know that like, it's a different level. But like, to correct people felt really weird. And they were like, your boyfriend, actually, it's my fiancé. There's no way to say it without like a yeah. well actually tone to it, but that's what it is. Okay, one more thing. You sent me this meme, and I do feel like it's on a- the same flight while I was watching that episode. <laughs> yeah. It just spoke to my soul. And I almost feel like it's a little relevant to today with our episode with Dr. Orna. <laughs> I I, this has lived rent free since Sunday at 9:52 a.m. when you sent it to me. <laughs> it's just a meme. I don't know if this is an original, but her name is I am Shri underscore. I don't know. But the meme is it was originally a tweet, I guess, and was on this meme page. Being in a relationship is solving problems together. Problems you wouldn't have if you were single. <laughs> <laughs> Hit you in the chest. <laughs> Which, listen, also, clearly neither of us are in a relationship with Rob. He's married. But he makes our life a lot easier. Ultimate solver. So if... Best thing about him. Someone like him, like, actually makes your life easier instead of harder. Because I say that sometimes. I'm like... I don't want to carry someone else's shit. I don't want to deal with someone else's problems. Like I got my own shit going on. I understand that's what a relationship is about. You know, you help each other through life. I mean, that's what we do. I'm happy to help you with your problems and vice versa. So it's not that, you know what I mean? That's what relationships are about. My problems are not, it's not the same thing as a romantic relationship. It's like the problem here is that like there's a mess everywhere and you've created the mess and now (laughs) I have to solve with you who's going to clean the mess up. Like that to me is like that type of thing. Like I don't find that with you. Like you know, business problems, we solve them together, but like you don't create problems in my life. Right, 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 right. Like a romantic partner would. Right, or like all of a sudden you have all this stress and anxiety surrounding like a what are we situationship or relationship, like what's going on or my partner this, my partner that. And it's like, man, what if that person wasn't around? <laughs> Stress-free, unbothered. No problems. I sleep great at night. <laughs> but again, I can't stress it enough. Like the right partner shouldn't make you feel like that. <laughs> but it is so funny when you frame it in that way where you're like, we're solving all these problems. We're in couples therapy. We're doing this. We're working through all of our shit together. And it's like, but that's why you have them. So you do really do need to balance. Like if it's worth it. 
Like we're in couples therapy to fix the problems that you've created with me. I wouldn't have any of these problems if you weren't around. That's why we're in therapy. <laughs> I'm not doing this for fun. I'm here because you traumatized me by cheating on me. And now we have to just like fix all these problems together. I know. It is really funny. But it is. It's just also like life. I don't know. Like the shit that I have to deal with with this dog. It's just like today. I had to like book his grooming. I have to clean up his hair all the time. I have to take him on walks. I have to, you know, do all like this stuff. It's like yeah. worth it. He doesn't because of what he provides to me. Like you just have to weigh it. But I just love that meme so much. <laughs> Being in a relationship is solving problems together problems you wouldn't have if you were single. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that, like, you said it without saying it, which is that, like, hopefully the trade-off is that the problems they bring in, they also bring enough good stuff, like, you know, companionship and, you know, having an actual partner right. in life and, you know, the sex, <laughs> but building yeah. stuff. I mean, if you, for that. well, but I'm like, if you're in-house, you know, like, much better than outsourcing. So if I can have a guy that can do all the stuff, I'd be outsourcing a task grab it. He's in-house. You're trying to save money. <laughs> well, it's also easy. Me too. I don't have to schedule it. I don't have to go through an app. I don't have to talk to anybody. You know. I hate talking to people. Right, right. Ugh. You know, I hate it. That is so funny. All right, we're going to thank a couple partners, and we're going to get into it with Orna. Okay, so... Speaking of having anxiety and stress, do you have anxious thoughts? Are you restless at night? Or do you just not feel like your best self? Making sure we feel our best should be a top priority. And by spending a few minutes with calm each day, you can be sure you're taking the necessary time to prioritize yourself. Again, just minutes a day. Like sometimes we just don't do things that are really so easy, you know, that really just don't take that much time, that are a fraction of our day and they can really help. So we love calm. We are partnering with calm, the number one mental wellness app to give you the tools that improve the way you feel. If you go to calm.com slash GGE, you'll get a special offer of 40% off a calm premium subscription and new content is added every week. So we love this app so much. I'm just going to go in it right now. I already pulled up is what I fall asleep to most nights, the calm Island. I had to stop doing the rain when it rained here every day and the rain was triggering. <laughs> Like you already had rain to fall asleep, (laughs) and then the rain was ruined my life. I was like, I cannot listen to LeBron's rain anymore. There's just like, I love the afternoon reset. I mean, here we are right now, it's like three o'clock in the afternoon. A lot of people get that afternoon slump. You just need something to kind of recharge, refocus. There's the daily move, there's a deep concentration. There's just take a deep breath, breathing exercise. I mean, it'll really walk you through it. It says, relax, quiet your mind, relieve stress. Technique is the extended exhale, four to six seconds. So, stuff like that, just staying on track, afternoon pick me up. I mean, anything you could possibly want. There's music in here. We love some of their playlists. There's all day workflow. Again, the playlists are really great. Mindfulness at work. Coping with the weight of the world is a whole collection. Meditation. If you have no idea where to start, we've talked about daily meditations with Jay Shetty. Mm -hmm. We talked about that when we had him on our podcast. So, and again, the sleep stories, it's kind of what they're known for. Also, they help you drift off quickly to sleep. And they're also great for getting kids to calm their minds at night. So, I mean, we all know kids have more anxiety than they ever did when we were growing up. So great stuff for kids in here as well. So really, you know, just mental health for the whole family. And for listeners of the show, Calm is offering an exclusive offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash GGE. Go to calm.com slash GGE for 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library. Yes, really. There's so much variety in there. Yeah, it's in so there. great. And another partner we absolutely love, which is Daily Harvest. So to be honest, like I've been so transient the last couple months. We both have. And. And we travel so much. I'm moving to a new home. It's just been hard to like prioritize, like wanting to cook a meal, getting groceries. I do want to eat healthy. I don't want to eat out every single meal. So Daily Harvest has been like such a great thing because they deliver delicious smoothies, flatbreads, soups, harvest bowls, bites, and more. It's built on organic fruits and vegetables and it's delivered to your door. So I always feel so good after I eat this. I just feel like everything is really like nutritious. There's a lot of variety. There's so much to choose from. And every time I have a Daily Harvest harvest bowl or a flatbread or a smoothie, I'm just so pleased with the ingredients Mm -hmm. and how my body feels. And if you're somebody who doesn't like to cook, but you're just like, I really don't want to like sacrifice health or things like that. There's just so many options and they work directly with farmers. They source the best ingredients. They freeze things at peak ripeness. So you really just pull stuff out of the freezer, heat it up and you're like good to go. So I'm just looking at the website. I really have just like loved the same stuff for a long time. They do change out new options, but the harvest bowls are my favorite. I love the butternut squash and kale shakshuka, black chickpea and harissa. Um, I had that herb squash and asparagus risotto the other day. I really loved it. And I would say, I mean, you know, I'm a mint and cacao 
smoothie for life, but I, that avocado and greens, oh, it's like so smooth. And the strawberry cashew, I'm just, Ooh. they're so good. I love the bites so much. I like to just like pop them in the freezer and just eat one. If you're somebody who like doesn't want like a whole cake or something, you're just like, I just want some sweets before bed or in the morning. The banana and cacao bites are amazing. The hazelnut and chocolate bites. So lots to choose from. And their app and their website are really, really super simple to use if you need to change your address, your delivery dates, anything like that. They're just great. So check it out. Lots to choose from. Stop settling with your next meal and try Daily Harvest. Go to dailyharvest.com slash GGE to get up to $65 off your first box. That's dailyharvest.com slash GGE for up to $65 off your first box, dailyharvest.com slash GGE. Okay, let's get into it with our guest. Yes. All right, guys, we are really excited for today's guest. It really has been a long time coming. She is a clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst practicing in New York City. She is on the faculty at NYU Postdoctoral Institute for Psychoanalysis, and she is about to launch the fourth season of her acclaimed docuseries, Couples Therapy on Showtime. We are so excited to finally welcome her on the show. Please welcome Dr. Orna Goralnik. Thank you for inviting me. Thank Thanks for, for joining us. Here. We had just the best pre-interview call. We're so excited. You speak to so many different couples about so many different topics on your show. And your advice is so fantastic. And Ashley and I really loved listening to the show. So we're just excited to pick a topic and dive in with you today. Mm -hmm. How did the fourth season go? Any new type of stuff you've never seen before? Honestly, every new couple has like their own very unique personality and unique thing that they bring. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you're going to be spending time with an amazing set of characters. I mean, the the people that we worked with this season have been just wonderful to work with, like deep, psychologically minded, different backgrounds, different issues. You know, there's a couple that come from like a Mormon background. There's a couple that come from like Palestinian Lebanese background, very good mix of characters, deep thinkers, they they really put themselves on the line. In terms of issues, it's interesting when we were thinking about the season as a whole, one of the questions that came up is, is there more of a question around um, monogamy this season. I'm not sure if I would characterize the season that way, but it is one of the themes. If I had to pull a theme, Mm. maybe I would put it more like how does the break out of monogamy, what function does it serve for each couple? Okay. Uh, So I have a question for you. We love this show, obviously. And it's so interesting. We were just doing this other podcast and we were talking to him about the show because he was talking about a very, what sounded like not great couples therapy experience where he just really felt like the therapist was against him and just blaming him for everything. And we were like, that's not really how it should feel. You should watch the show if you really want kind of roadmap of how it should feel. But I'm curious if you had any hesitation doing this show. Was there any part of you that was like, I don't want to put this on TV or a part of you that was like, if I can help other couples dealing with the same things that they're going to see on the show, I'm all for it. Or what was your thoughts about it? Meaning earlier on when we just, yeah, before. Yeah. 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 Uh, Did I have hesitation? Absolutely. I had had terror. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I was a hesitation of many sorts. I mean, first of all, both the directors and producers and I weren't sure it's going to work. Mm-hmm. That was the first hesitation, meaning will the therapy really unfold the way therapy unfolds when there are cameras, when we know it's documented? I didn't know that I could even function in front of a camera. I mean, am I mm-hmm. going to get paralyzed? Am I going to feel self-conscious? Am I going like, to lose my capacity to think like an analyst? I, I had no idea what it's going to be. I mean, I'm not like a show business person. I'm a very private person, typically. We didn't know if the couples are going to be able to go through a real therapeutic process, knowing that there are other people kind of mm-hmm. witnessing it at this while we're doing the work and later. And then I didn't know, am I going to be doing good work? Is it going to be good work that I'm going to be putting out there? Am I going to be embarrassed by what I've done or more? It was mortifying. I mean, people told me you could ruin your career by doing this. And then, of course, there are all these issues around losing the whole frame of confidentiality. Mm-hmm. I mean, typically, 
when I work with people, there's like a very, very strict firewall of confidentiality. Like I never, ever. Right. <laughs> and, and, right. and suddenly it's like, just like all, completely removed. It's like, whoa, this is like public information. Mm-hmm. How's it going to work? Is that ethical? Is this going to be okay for the clients? What are they consenting to? Anyway, there were a very long list of hesitations and fears and uncertainties. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because my viewpoint going into the show, watching it was like, are people really going to go there? Are people going to be as honest and open? And really what you saw in the first season and every season there, there's so many different themes of what couples go through in terms of narcissism and cheating and monogamy and so many different themes. People really went there. You know, I was surprised too, but it opened your eyes up to every couple just has a very unique and different set of situations and stories. And you can see yourself represented in so many of these storylines. Yeah. It's interesting. That was like, I asked you that and it's like, duh, the answer, because it's like the number one thing is confidentiality. And it's like, let's put this on TV. Let's just make this the least confidential it could be. So thanks for sharing your feelings surrounding it. And we can't wait for the next season. Yeah. So today we wanted to talk to you about conflict in a relationship and a romantic relationship and fighting and styles of fighting. And you said this thing to me, we spoke before the interview and you said you were talking about how to fight and what is a fight and who gets to say. And when you said who gets to say, it was like a real like mind explosion for me because I think we've all been in these fights were like one person's yelling and the other person's like, why are you fighting with me? And the other person's like, I'm not fighting with you. It's a discussion. And even in that moment, it's like, why does one person get to decide that it's a fight when I didn't think it was a fight? And when we polled our listeners also and said, what are you looking for in this type of conversation? So many things came up in terms of going to sleep angry, having so much anger and not being able to control it or being on the other end of the spectrum, being passive aggressive. So it really opened my eyes up when you just said like, who gets to say? Because there's so many different styles of this conflict with your partner. I agree. Yeah. So fighting, disagreeing, arguing. I mean, it's like, I mean, it's everything. It's everything in the sense that, I mean, if you want to like totally zoom out, difference is where growth happens. If there's no difference, there's no development. You know, if a baby has everything they need, they will not develop a thought. If everything is handed to them, they're not going to move. So difference and, and bridging differences is where the action is. It's where growth is. It's where desire comes into play. It's everything. So people get really scared of difference and really scared of, um, I'm not even going to call it fighting. I'm just going to call it difference for the for this moment. And they get paralyzed by, oh my God, if we are different, if we think differently about two different things, if we need different things, it, it feels very dangerous and, and a lot at risk. And it, it is partially, I mean, that's in our little mini pre-conversation when I was talking about like who gets to decide what's a fight and what's not, it is partially determined by culture and by the family you came from, where for some people, difference is just like a way of living. I mean, there's always like difference. And I mean, some people, you, you probably all know people that the moment you say something, they immediately say the opposite, just as a way of kind of <laughs> having a conversation Mm -hmm. is always devil's advocate. And it's just like a playful way of living. While for other people, those kind of differences can be like really alarming and Mm -hmm. great and and feel very bad and scary. So people differ in what they think of as conflict. They differ in terms of how much um, difference and disagreement they can tolerate before they feel like something very bad is happening. So one of the things that couples have to do is to kind of align on what they consider like a conversation, what they consider an argument, what they consider a fight, and what they consider something really destructive. And sometimes it has to do with the actual content of what is being said. Sometimes it has to do with the tone of voice. It doesn't even matter Mm -hmm. what the content is, but if the tone is aggressive or 
too stubborn or too emotional in one way or another, if someone cries, it can mean a lot of things to different people. Um, and they have to kind of align on what's a tolerable range of conversation for the couple, which is actually a lot of what I do when I work. Mm-hmm. Just figure out what's a workable range and what feels like it's just too much. Do you feel like a lot of people adopt their parents' style of arguing and fighting? I think people, either they get primed to a certain culture of conversation that mimics their parents, or they are phobic of repeating what they had at home. And like everything that reminds them of their parents, even mm. in the smallest ways, they, they they get, you know, paralyzed and resistant and... So it's kind of either or, but they're always in some relationship to how they grew up. Yes. Yeah. So when you have a couple come in that cannot agree on what's a fight, you know, it's, you have someone that's really any change in tone, any raising of a voice is really alarming, like you said. And then there's somebody that's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. We're having a conversation and you do have one person, you're screaming at me. And the other person's like, I'm literally not. Where do you even begin to find that middle ground? I think what I do in those cases, I first of all try to parse out what has to do with the content Mm -hmm. that they're trying to negotiate and what has to do with, let's say, you know, manners of speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, And sometimes it really is just manners of speaking and then teaching each one of the couple to understand that the other person is hearing them differently from how they mean it, which is not easy. Mm -hmm. takes people time to really get out of their own perspective and kind of listen to what's going on through the other person's shoes. And it might be understanding the other person's history. Let's say someone had a very abusive parent. Mm -hmm. The moment they hear any kind of increased feeling in their partner, they're already cowering the way they cowered as a child. So so helping people understand that that might be going on, that the, that the way the partner is listening to them is not only an indication of how they're speaking, but it might have something to do with their partner's history. So- it really is so true that like, you just have no idea how you sound and how you're being digested by other people. And I've had that in romantic relationships. Ashley and I've had that where like, I've said a thing and she digests it in a way that like, I had no idea I sounded like that and vice versa. And it is hard to say to somebody like, you don't hear yourself because the other person can say back to you like, well, you didn't hear me correctly. You know, like, I feel like your defense, there's a defense to that as well. And then it's hard to get out of that cycle. And then there's the question of, what about the content that the two people are talking about mm-hmm. is making it so hard? Because right. sometimes people, they focus on the the wrapping of the communication, but really what's going on is they're using that as an excuse to not talk about what's really going on. Uh huh. So sometimes, you know, people can say like, why are you yelling at me? But it's not about the yelling. It's like, I don't really want to hear what you're saying. Mm. That thing you're saying, I, I don't want it. And that's the, the teasing out what's what. So do you tell people to address the tone first or to address the content first? Like, where do we start? <laughs> I, I don't have a rule book of, of like how to go about it, I, but I listen to both and I try to understand like what what's what here? Is it is it about the way the, the conversation is wrapped or are there things that are difficult to say to each other or a negotiation that's going to be a really difficult negotiation and then the tone is like a red herring. Mm. Okay. I'm really curious. And this isn't a joke. Like you're lucky that you are on the show and the cameras follow these couples home and sort of film them having arguments. And I remember as a child, there was a lot of screaming in my house. Just my mom just absolutely eviscerates you. And I used to say to her, like the amount of screaming never ends in this house. And she used to tell me that that was completely untrue. And I used to always think like, if we could just put a camera in this house (laughs) and I could bring it to a therapist I would feel validated because somebody would be like, this is photographic evidence that you were doing this. So I'm wondering, like, do you ever tell couples outside of your show to film their arguments? Is that something that like people ever do? Because like, I do see a world in which somebody's like, you do this all the time. The other person's like, no, I don't. And then you, you're like, run the tape. Right. (laughs) It's like, do you find that that's like a therapeutic tool? As long as everybody knows they're being filmed. Like, is that, is that something you've ever told people to do? No, I've never 
ask people to do that. First of all, that's upsetting what, what you're describing. And that's really hard when you're you. suffering some kind of reality. And the person who's like inflicting this suffering on you is, is like denying what's going on. That's rough. Yes. Thank you. Rough. <laughs> yeah, that really sucks. But it happens in romantic relationships, I think, too. So, yeah, of course. I mean, it happens politically, right? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. aren't we living in like two very different realities and like <laughs> yeah. I mean people have to find they, they have to be able to trust their own experience it's not you know it's the camera mom agreeing or not agreeing that that's what happened that's not where the real growth is you, you, you have to learn to trust your own experience and then you also sometimes have to learn to entertain the idea that there are multiple ways to interpret the same event. Mm -hmm. Meaning you might feel like, I mean, I know it from my own kids, like one of my kids might feel like, like I'm really like being very uh, overbearing with them and, and thick, but I know what I'm doing. They got to get this thing done or they, you know, whatever, when they're little that you just got to put your shoes on and there's no way to get out of the house without that. And for them, it's like, really terrible what's going on they're being like controlled and both realities are true Mm -hmm. so it's you know this multiple reality thing and multiple perspectives thing is like it's everywhere it's ubiquitous we gotta figure out ways to live with it and and you can't just record (laughs) the other person and the truth is going to be out there the truth is inside so how do you marry those two or is it just coming to the conclusion that I experience this completely differently because I'm sure you see this every day is a couple that's like, that's not what happened. It's almost like, yes, it is. And someone's not playing like make office. believe, but yeah. I see it in my office. Two mm-hmm. people are talking. I'm right there. I see it. And each one of them has a completely different experience of what just happened in my office. And I understand why they each have that experience. Mm-hmm. Experience is not just out there in reality, it's not like a a scientific fact. Experience has to do with how a person experiences it, Mm -hmm. which depends on so many things and what they choose to to attend to and ignore in what the other person is saying. You know, if you're primed, if you're really looking for a fight, you're going to look for like the one word that your partner said that is really, ah, gotcha. And if you're looking for a way to connect you're going to ignore all those like triggers and you're going to find the heart in what your partner is saying. So cameras can't do that. It's, it's, it's an orientation. Sure. And ultimately at the end of the day, you know, your experience is your reality. And so it doesn't matter if somebody else watches this TV show of you and your partner, if you feel invalidated and you feel like somebody is coming at you and putting you down, that doesn't, right. It doesn't really matter. That is your experience. And I like what you said about being able to trust your experience and really having the confidence to say to somebody, like, maybe you don't agree with me, but that is how I experienced this. And if you love me, you will care that I experienced it. that. And maybe I can even tell you what in my history, what what in my mood made me experience it that way. Okay. It doesn't mean it's all of it. It just means that's part of the of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like it's normal to never fight? And when I say normal, like, is that bad to never fight? I think it's a little suspicious. Okay. (laughs) I do too. I just, somebody asked us that um, in an Instagram story slide and I was really surprised by it because I can't relate, but. I mean, I think that there are, I don't know, I, I, fighting, it could be, that could be perceived as just as yelling and screaming. And I think some people are really good at managing conflict in a mature, rational manner. It's got to be totally out of the ordinary to never have had a difference in opinion or conflict. But I could see where there's the world with two people that just are really good at hearing the other person and coming to a resolution in a rational way. The both two people who have stable, secure attachments, they've done a lot of work and they're able to navigate through the world without like raising their voice. I agree. Totally agree. Yeah. I, I, I like the way you defined it, that there might be a difference that they need to kind of work through, but it doesn't have to become, you know, either a fight or or something like raising voices or an impasse. But working through differences, whether it's 
different interests in the same moment like the, like one person needs this another person needs that or just a difference in perspective i mean i think that's kind of built into human relationships i would hope so i would hope that you don't have a couple that's like we've never disagreed we oh this is like, what what's happening here you share a brain <laughs> that doesn't sound sexy for one <laughs> i don't know what the what the intimacy is like if you think about the every single thing in the world the exact same way but I would wonder if somebody was being like tremendously passive aggressive and just choosing not to argue and have fights. I am more prone to sort of like stamping it down. I am just a pretty easygoing person in general. Nobody that's dated me would ever say that I yell and scream and say things I can't take back. That's just not my personality in any way. But I think you do get into the, the cycle of some people who are just so terrified of fighting that it becomes just like, yeah, we never fight. And it's like, well, that's not good. You should be able to voice some things that you feel. But being passive aggressive there the, i mean you can fight in ways that are not very vocal i mean being sure. passive aggressive you can still fight mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you can, like always forget to load the dishwasher that's a pretty serious fight mhm mhm quiet <laughs> quiet fight <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> True, true. I do want to talk about fighting about the same thing over and over again, but I just I was wondering about your thoughts on going to bed angry also. And, you know, everybody has these different styles, being passive aggressive, yelling and screaming. Some people refuse to address it. Do you think going to bed angry is unhealthy or are there sometimes when it's healthy? Yeah, you just, that's every couple's cliche marriage advice. Never go to bed angry. Uh, all right. I don't know. <laughs> we want to hear what you have to say about it. It's a provocative little question. Um, what do I really think about that? I think there's some wisdom to the general idea, don't go to bed angry. Mm -hmm. I don't mean it concretely, because sometimes people need time to be able to process things. And concretely, they may need to go to bed angry one night, two nights, seven nights before they can address something. But if we don't take it too concretely, I think the idea is... Don't just let it simmer. Try to resolve the issue you're struggling with. You might need to take some time, but try to resolve it. Don't just let it sit. Well, you said this thing about washing dishes, and we did want to get into it. And in terms of breaking the cycle, about fighting about the same thing over and over and over again, and to me, it sort of falls into two buckets. Either you're fighting about the same specific act, like somebody cheated, or something more is pervasive, the right word. That it's just like, you never help me around the house. You don't help me with the kids. I work just as much as you and you won't do the dishes. And people get into this cycle of fighting about the same thing over and over and over again. And I find it really hard to break the cycle personally in romantic relationships. So would love to just talk about what happens when a couple can't break the cycle of just we're having the same fight every single day. Yeah. I mean, that's really the bread and butter of my work, of of couples' work, I mean, is these kind of repeat patterns that couples get stuck in. I mean, that's when they bring in a therapist. And it's always interesting, those repeat fights. I mean, from my perspective, it's like a riddle. Like, why would a couple do the same thing over and over if they know it's going to get them into the same fight or the same trouble? Why would they do the same thing over and over? Like what's in it for each of them? Mm -hmm. And that could be many things. It could be that they really disagree about something fundamental. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We can like, you know, fake talk about the the dishes. I mean, I I I don't really think it's about the dishes, but let's say it was about the dishes. Let's say they really disagree about who should be doing what. Right. I mean, some might say, look, I'm doing the child care or I'm doing or I'm bringing home the money and I expect you to do that piece of it and that's my stance. So you keep fighting me about this, but that is my stance. So there might be that there's a real disagreement there about whatever they're fighting, but then they might be really through the fight about, you know, I I had a, we had a couple on the show. I mean, sadly, they didn't make it yet. Uh, into the edits, but they had a a repeat fight about manners in a restaurant. How should you eat in a restaurant? Repeat fight for many years, the same fight. <laughs> and you'd think, okay, that should be easy to solve, right? And then finally, we got all the way down to it was a way for them to negotiate class differences between them. 
because mm-hmm. you know manners around eating have a lot to do with class and who's right who's wrong if you ask one person to accommodate you does that mean like okay middle class trumps working class what what are you agreeing to when you're resolving the fight what are you really giving so it's a riddle these kind of repeat fights are often about something else or there could be repeat fights that are really kind of a proxy to something else let's say someone is like unhappy with what's going on sexually but they don't know how to talk about it so they take the fight elsewhere and they kind of have this bizarre repeat fight over there when it's really not about that it's a way that they're trying to resolve something else that they don't know how to talk about we just did a whole manners episode so i've got to know what the fight was about because if you're talking with your mouth full the whole (laughs) night that's not a class thing but like i find that interesting because what two weeks ago we did a whole manners episode and yeah so i'm wondering how like what level of it that was but you didn't address class Well, so our take was like, of course, there's things that are tied into class, salad fork, whatever, you know, but then there's just things that like class don't come into with just basic politeness, how to hold a utensil, politeness, treating a server in a certain way. I guess there is a spectrum, but can you share with us or no? I'm just out of curiosity. Like what would boil down to class when it comes to manners? I think manners are completely an expression of class. Okay. I can't one thing that we do manners wise that is not class related you know if you sit in a bedouin tent and you don't burp after dinner you're rude (laughs) (laughs) okay well culturally too yeah if you're like in an asian in certain asian societies if you don't slurp your soup you're rude well i guess that's cultural too then yeah And and we talked about that too like cultural differences that are less than like just because you didn't grow up with money doesn't mean you don't know how to... Everybody's been told, don't talk with your mouth full, right? But this person in that couple that I was talking about with class, he knew. He knew how to eat. But with his partner, he didn't want to accommodate that style of eating because he was like, hey, I'm trying to remain true to the way my family was. Okay. I don't, I don't want to just act as if I'm of a different class. There's something meaningful to me about licking the plate. <laughs> licking the plate? <laughs> Just licking the plate. Okay. All right. <laughs> I can definitely see a world in which somebody feels like their partner already thinks that they're of a different socioeconomic level as them mm-hmm. and then really internalizes any type of comments about the way that they eat and their manners in a restaurant, I can like really see it being like a huge like put down. And I've dated somebody like that who probably already thought that I thought I was a little bit better than him. And so any comment about the way he lived his life was taken with such unbelievable, like he was so mad. He was so hurt. He was so insulted when I was just like, maybe don't wear a t-shirt to meet my dad. Maybe we don't wear a comic book t-shirt to meet my dad. It doesn't mean I think you're poor and you can't afford other stuff. For me, it just was a politeness thing. I think he saw it as me looking down on him as a person and where he came from. So I can definitely see that like somebody would take it as like a shot. But I'm like, we've dated. I'm going to know if you lick your plate clean (laughs) if we're in a long-term relationship. But anyway, we don't dwell on manners. I just think it's funny because we just discussed this a couple weeks ago. I'm just, I'm really like the stuff about like you never help me around the house. It like really sticks with me. And I don't, I'm curious how you negotiate that. Cause I do think one partner always, and it's usually the woman feels like I work just as much as you and I come home and I'm responsible for everything around the house. Uh, I'm responsible for the kids. I'm the primary caregiver. So how do you even begin negotiating that type of fight? It's a tough one. And it's especially at the stage where people have young kids it's inevitable that there's going to be difficulties around that. It's inevitable, especially in like our society where, you know, the whole burden is on the family. There's no real welfare support for families. It's like all on the parents. And it's inevitable for a variety of reasons. Of course, there's like, I mean, if it's like a straight couple, but not even a straight couple, there's like gender politics, like there's kind of a division of labor that is expected, like the one that takes the maternal function versus the paternal function and the kind of distribution of labor power dynamics that go with that and the, and the unfairness of that. But then there's the fact that when there's too much to do 
and there's always too much to do when they're kids. To some degree, you can only see your own nose. You can only see what you're doing. And you're always doing too much. It's always some kind of excess. And it, it's hard to see what the other person is doing. So there's always some feeling that you're doing more than the other because that's all you see. It's kind of baked in. Mm -hmm. So what I do, um, it depends on the couple. With some couples, I really have them concretely write out what they each do. So the other person knows, not for the purpose of, you know, some compare and despair, like I do more than you see proof, but for the purpose of really appreciating what the other person is going through and knowing, just knowing, not not for like comparing, because how do you weigh mm -hmm. tartar and what's, I mean, I mean, for some people, like sitting on the floor and playing with a baby is like a lot harder than like mm -hmm. doing five rounds of laundry. It's 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 subjective. Mm -hmm. um, but just to know, to really keep in mind that you're not the only person living, breathing, working, suffering, but that another person is out there doing something too, that already sometimes just changes the dynamic. And then bartering, like, okay, what's easier for you? What would be better for you if we just distributed the work differently. What would be easier for you? Like, let's see if we can do things where each person is doing the thing that is not the hardest for them. Is there a way to give each other breaks? Meaning to try to get out of the lockdown paradigm of like, who's doing more? But other ways to think about the same thing. Mm -hmm. I like that you also said it's subjective. Like this thing that doesn't really take a lot out of you is really draining to me or exhausting mm -hmm. where this other thing may be the opposite for you. I'd love to talk about just a couple other examples. I know you've spoke with Raina about how you like to think in terms of that as opposed to these like broad topics. What about a couple that is there was infidelity at one point on one end and they want to make it work, but they can't get past that. And it just keeps coming up and keeps coming up. And let's even boil it down to just one instance, not a, an affair, you know, just like, like a one night stand. Yeah, sure. And the partner just can't get past it. We have a couple like that on the on the season that's dropping now. Again, this can take on so many meanings. It so depends on the couple and sort of what they're coming into the relationship mm -hmm. with, what their ideal is. You know, there are plenty of couples that you know, they're not even like that invested in monogamy nowadays. So it's mm. like not a big deal. And other people where it shatters some kind of very intense ideal of trust and specialness, and it it really kind of lacerates the person to their core. Mm. It, it's very different for people. And I think the first thing to do is to really understand that context. What does cheating, monogamy, specialness, what what does that kind of loyalty mean to each person? Like how, how to interpret the act? And then you often get, when you really start exploring things, you often get to all kinds of surprising meanings that you don't expect. Like a person can feel like terribly betrayed by the event and they can't get over it because it really reminds them of like a sibling rivalry they had like 20 years ago. And there's something about the scene that kind of replays kind of an old childhood scene with a sibling. And, and that's really what it's about. And that is for them to do kind of work on that. For some people, it might really have to do with like trust issue really with that particular partner that it's not really necessarily about cheating, but it's about trust in general. Mm -hmm. One who's like not completely honest or honest in a different way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it can be like a clue to something else. Mm -hmm. Okay. In an instance like this, where somebody, like Ashley said, just cheated one time, but you know, the deal was monogamy and you, you broke the deal. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think on the surface, people are in therapy to work on things. And of course, they're there because they want to get over it. They want to move past it. But have you ever had to say to somebody or would you ever say to somebody like, it's time to make a decision that you are going to mm -hmm. get over this or you need to split up? And I know you don't tell people to split up, but like maybe we're still talking about this a year and a half after mm -hmm. it happened. Is there a point at which you do have to say to somebody like, 
you need to make a decision today that you want to be with this person and you are going to forgive them, or you have to make a decision that you will never forgive this and that the trust is broken forever and go. I I wouldn't say it exactly in those terms, but to some degree, yes, I I do ask people when people are dug in, in in a place of like refusing to move on. I ask them, what do you need? I need you to think really deep and hard. What do you need from your partner that you can imagine will allow you to move on? And if they cannot, if they really cannot, and it's not because their partner is just really like, well, they're they're actually lying all over the place. But let's say it's a situation where the partner is like doing their share of the work, then I need to ask the person, what is the big risk of forgiveness? Like, well, what, I mean, forgiving is, is a risk and well, mm-hmm. what's the issue there? Like, why hold on to a grievance? Like, what satisfaction are you getting out of a grievance? I love the use of specialness, you know, and I'm sure that's wrapped up in ego too. Like, mm-hmm. there's got to be this thing of you're like, because I just can't get over it because you made me feel less special. Like, that was the thing that I needed the most in the world from my yeah. partner and you broke it and... But yeah, at some point, move past it or end the relationship. Yeah, and and, and what what is this like, if you're really, really hung up on the idea of being special, like what's going on there? I mean, it's great to be special some of the time, but none of us are special all the time. Mm-hmm. Like we share the world with other people. So mm-hmm. what's going on there? Well, is it also wrapped up in just like, I'm afraid to forgive you and move on from this because you might do it again. And then I'm going to feel really stupid having done that. Cause like I knew better and I'm smarter than this and you've already fooled me once. And I feel like it is a little frightening to decide that we are going to forgive somebody if, and maybe they do it again. But I mean, at some point that is just life and you vulnerability. Know? You have to get over it. Yeah. You're talking about like not forgiving as some as if that could control the other person. If you don't offer forgiveness, <laughs> right, right. control the other person. Boy, is that hard work. Yeah. Okay. So another example and something that, you know, Raina being in our 30s, late 30s are seeing even more with our friends, people in our age group with women and wanting children and usually a male partner that isn't sure, you know, like where it preferably be a hard no <laughs> so that you could make a decision. We just keep seeing this woman, for example, that really wants children and the clock is ticking quite literally. And the man is unsure. And for whatever reasons, again, we know every situation is different and every couple is different. It's hard for you to give completely overarching advice. But if there's anything to provide here with people that are really running into this and just a constant partner that is just like, I don't know, I'm not ready now, but I might. And this woman's freaking out. Yeah, it's a tough one. I, I, I'm familiar with that. Mm-hmm. I don't have like a yeah baked response to that, but I can tell you how I think with people about it. There are all sorts of ways to have kids nowadays, right? doesn't have to be in the context of like a heteronormative, got to have it this way or that way. There are plenty of ways to have kids. And then between a couple... Again, it's a question of what is it about, right? This this kind of struggle or difference, what is it about? Is it about something else between them? Is, is there some pattern there where decisions get made always in a certain way? Meaning, d- does the question of the baby replicate another way that this couple manages difference between them? I mean, for let's say it's between a woman and her husband or boyfriend, is there something that the boyfriend is replicating? Are they always kind of on the verge of like, ah, no, to to other things like moving um, in together, right? Moving in together, moving, uh, taking a new job. Is there some way that this person is just like resistant to change or or has a way of framing things so that there's always someone pushing them from the outside like meaning is it more than about the baby is is there more to this dynamic that they need to sort out sometimes one person needs to be the leader needs to like push the couple okay we're gonna do it just trust me we're gonna do it on faith we're gonna 
have a baby. We're going to move to a different place. We're going to leave a job. Um, depends. Yeah. We've seen a lot and we've seen, you know, a woman that is like, I'll, let's just do it. I'll take care of it. You know, I'm happy to enter into this decision together, knowing that I'm willing to carry more of the weight, but that's some people's nightmare. You know, you want to have a 50, 50 child raising, <laughs> you know, it's tough. So yeah, but you if know. you're with a partner that doesn't want that, then Right. I just think it's tough all the way around because you're like, it's interesting to kind of concede on what you wanted. You wanted a 50-50 partnership and then you want a child so badly that you're like, I'll just do it all. Just fine. You just kind of, you just like impregnate me and then I'll, we'll figure it out. And then you get into a point where you are doing so much. It's hard to handle. You're resentful. And the, then the guy's like, but this is what you told me. <laughs> like, <laughs> It's really tricky. And we just keep seeing this. So we keep seeing like an unsure man and the relationships end. But that's in a way that's a variant on this issue of difference, because I've also seen it the other way around where mm -hmm. the couple gets into a relationship where the male agreed to kind of be in a way kind of a donor like a familiar donor, but then once the baby's there and, and, and life evolves, they want like more and more and more. Mm. They want like 50-50 participation. And the mom's like, I didn't want you here. She's <laughs> like, I want to take care of that. For. <laughs> um, it, I mean, life is, is that. I mean, things mm -hmm. change and how you feel about things change and how do you negotiate difference, like really respecting the other person's otherness and taking care of yourself and not imposing yourself on another person, but really finding a way to negotiate difference. It is really interesting. Years ago, a friend of mine told me that she was going to couples therapy because she wanted to move in, get married. He did not want to do those things at that point. And I remember she was going to therapy and she said, the therapist said that if he has to qualify why he doesn't want to do these things, then I have to qualify why it's so important to me to do them. And I was so mad in that moment. And I was like, who the fuck is she to say that to you? But over the years, I have really marinated on that. And it just, my thoughts on it have changed a little bit. And I do think that everybody should be able to put it out on the table of like, well, this is why I want to do these things. This is why I don't want to have kids. But also, if you really do want to have kids, you should have to just because that's the norm doesn't mean that that's what we have to do. Absolutely. And I think that everybody has like a dog in this fight. Yeah. Do you ever I know it's hard for you to tell people exactly what to do, but we've seen women come up with a, a deadline of if you can't give me an answer on this i need to leave this relationship because having a family is so important to me do you find that to be something that you endorse or see people do and i'm not saying like it's tomorrow it's you know i'm going to give you some time but at some point you know i'm whatever 37 38 i have to I move do. on mm -hmm. i do yeah, if that's important to a woman and her partner doesn't want to do that and doesn't want to be involved, that's totally legitimate. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we really wanted to talk about anger and the style of fighting that really is a lot of yelling, screaming, maybe even saying things that you don't mean and you can't, or maybe you do mean them, but you can never take them back. Uh -huh. So if you are somebody who is prone to that, we kind of want to talk about, you know, what what is the right partner for you? And how can you exist in these relationships? I mean, for me, if I dated somebody like that, it would last five minutes. I will never deal with something like that. But if you're somebody that's just like, I just find myself screaming and swearing and I can't stop. How does that manifest in a relationship? How can we find ways of controlling that? Do we ever find ways of controlling it? If you're like, that's just how I fight. That's how I fight. That's how it's going to be. I mean, even though I want to respect the fact that people are different and they have different styles of communication and not every emotional communication is necessarily like an offense or a bad thing. Having said all that, I do, first of all, think that there is only a certain range within which a real conversation can happen. And if you go beyond that range, it's not a conversation. It's not mm -hmm. even a fight. It's just a you know, offloading or dumping or in, in severe cases, just abuse. So I think if you're entering that zone where it's not a constructive conversation where two people can actually hear something about what the other person is saying and consider it, I don't think it's productive. And I think just saying that's how I am is not enough. 
Mm -hmm. then you got to do some work on yourself because you want to bring yourself into the zone where there's an actual exchange. And an exchange means that whatever you're saying, the other person can hear and process. And when they're talking to you, you can hear and process so that there can be a real back and forth. If it's just kind of a dumping, okay, once in a while, fine, but th that's not a conversation. No, it's not even a fight. It's something else. Mm -hmm. I think awesome. also some people are just quick to anger and react quickly. And I've worked on that throughout the years. It used to be more me, but I feel it in my body, like right away in my gut. And I've learned how to manage it. And sometimes it's just time. It's just 10 minutes. It's just don't react now, take a walk, breathe in and out, little things like that. I mean, do you offer tools to people who just are easily reactive is the word, but Absolutely. can get the, I'm a rational person. I can communicate. It's just, it's the, it's that immediate reaction. And in that moment, you almost feel out of body. Yeah, it's really good that you're you're locating it in the body because that's where the intervention is. Mm -hmm. It's physiological, like mm -hmm. anger, all feelings. It's, it's a physiological experience. And when people are quick to kind of spike, the best way to deal with that is to, first of all, know how to listen into cues in the body and to address it at the level of the body. So yeah, breathe, walk kind of on, on a physiological level, bring yourself down to that range of emotion where you can still be in communication. I think it's also just it's like training. You just don't send the text. And it's hard because you really feel not yourself. It's like, I keep doing this too, where over the years, it's like, you know, you're going to regret this later. So just throw the phone across the room, whatever it takes, even five minutes, just that immediate you get so fired up, even if you're fighting with somebody on the internet or whatever it is, you know? So it's a practice for me is I know I won't feel this in even five minutes. So if I can just not do the thing right now, I can wrap my head around it in a rational way. Uh, you you said it better than me. I, I, I like <laughs> <laughs> I've had to work on it. But it's a uh, journey. <laughs> I feel like as the other partner, I like and not her other partner, but I can't be spoken to like that. It does take me back to childhood. The amount of screaming, feeling like somebody has just eviscerated you. And I had this fight with a partner even like two years ago where he like really like just demolished me and my character. And I bring it up kind of a lot. And he even said to me like kind of recently, like you, you got to stop bringing this up. And I was like, I don't think you understand like how traumatic it was for me, like that moment. So for me, like, I just have to say to people, like, I just, if you're going to be like that, I just, I can't be around it. So as the other partner, I think it's perfectly fine to just draw the boundary and be like, when you're in a less condescending way, but when you're done talking like this, that's when we can reconvene. Cause I just, I can't be around it. It really is very bad for me. That seems very legitimate. I mean, unless you really block any communication. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. But, you know, I think it's perfectly fair to say, like, this isn't go anywhere. And if you're at this volume level and you're just chucking grenades at me, I just can't be here, you know? I think what helps in those moments is to say to the person, I really want to hear what you have to say, but you got to figure out a way to calm down. <laughs> do you feel like there's like a meme that says like never in the history of calming down have says telling a person to calm down, calm them down. <laughs> right. Same with like Absolutely. when you're ready to but stop being like But if you say to the person, I really want to hear what you have to say. Right. That's the thing you're really saying. Just figure out a way to organize yourself so I can hear it. Or is there a world in which you put it back on yourself? Like, I really want to hear what you have to say, but I'm unable to respond when I'm being spoken to in this manner and this, we're not going to get anywhere. Wait, this is too upsetting for me when you're mm -hmm. yelling. Can I want to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. Can you find a way to speak to me so I can hear it? Yeah, I think that's a great way to frame it. Like, I am receptive to this. I'm not closed off, but screaming is not it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Scream when they feel like the other person is not listening. Mm -hmm. so right. You got to figure out your part in it. Mm -hmm. Do you find people in your work that have a real aversion to apologizing? <laughs> <laughs> and is there an over apologizing? Is there a healthy middle ground? I'm just wondering if couples really come to an impasse where like someone just needs that apology and there's a person that 
doesn't feel like you apologize unless you feel like you've done something wrong, which they don't think that they've done. You know, it's interesting. I'm just writing uh, about this. I was writing about it today. I'm writing an essay. And I think one of the things that is hardest for people is to feel like they've hurt or harmed someone else and they resist and fight and and avoid and say all sorts of like silly things, you know, like, oh, sorry, you feel this way. And it's hard for people to say, I know I've done something that hurt you. Mm. And it's sort of similar to what we were saying earlier about working at home, like, like doing the chores at home. Like people from within their own experience, they don't intend to harm. They're just trying to like take care of themselves or further their own agenda. They're not really grokking that they're harming another person always. So it's hard to lead people to a place. I mean, as a therapist, it's hard to lead people to a place where they can be accountable, take responsibility well and not feel like, okay, they've now taken on all the badness in the world. They've just- right. Like, I, I love that you framed it that way. Like, why this is a whole just other discussion. Maybe this is what the essay you're writing. Like, why do we have a hard time apologizing? Because we think it reflects on us as being a bad person, a person that would hurt someone they care about, a person with ill intentions. Yeah. When we all fuck up. We all do things, whether we meant to or not. So I see that that's probably the struggle of like, I'm not a person that would do that. And it's like, but you did. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it's like, then people really do these mental gymnastics of how to apologize without saying the language that their partner actually wants to hear. Right. And we did a whole episode called, I'm sorry you feel that way. Based on this, you know, like, I'm sorry that you got upset and- and this, of it. Yeah. Right. It has nothing to do with me. And then that can feel really invalidating too. Cause like, it's almost like getting really close to an orgasm and then not being able to finish. And you're just like, I thought you heard me, but then all I'm going to get out of this is I'm sorry that you feel that way. And it's, it's so disappointing. And I was arguing with somebody the other day and he sort of was just like, well, that's not what happened. Well, that's not what happened. And I was like, can you just acknowledge that this happened and this is my experience and say you're fucking sorry. I think about that a lot. I think about, we all do this. When someone wants an apology from us, we have to think like, did I do this thing? And what does it say about me as a person? Because I didn't really think that I would do that, but here we are. (laughs) So squirmy situation. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. But do you think there's power in saying, I'm sorry? Like, I think it's a, it's a profound thing to, to grasp. Wow, I get it. I get how this thing I did doesn't matter why I did it, doesn't matter, but I can see how this thing I did hurt you. And that matters to me. I think that's a profound thing to offer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean I'm a bad person or a selfish person at my core. It just, we're all imperfect. I have had those arguments with people where you're like, I can't believe that's what you think of me. I didn't do that on purpose. That's not the kind of person I am. Like, how could you have interpreted this the way that you are? And yes, I can see why saying sorry just feels like you're almost admitting that their view of you is correct. Which is, doesn't mean that. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. In terms of taking too much time, like, is there too much time that can pass before you say you're sorry or not enough? Like, is it bad to just, obviously it's just abdicating right away and just be like, I'm sorry, it's not great, but how much time is too much time? You don't want it to be empty and, and right. (laughs) The empty apology. Too much time to go by. That's, that's terrible. I mean, I think that's probably situational. You know, you could have an ex come back years later (laughs) Speaking from experience, right? Too. A years long fight. Yeah. No, but where they're like, it took me years to even realize this thing I did because I've self reflected. I haven't been in therapy. I've changed. And I didn't think I did that, but I did. And sometimes you don't want it, but sometimes it feels it's, nice. I don't think it never feels bad mm-hmm. to have someone give you a genuine apology of something it's that they did. Me. Yeah. It's meaningful. Always- yeah. The thing I'm writing about is how I feel like the recent political movements, especially like BLM, have really helped people with um, being Mm. able to be accountable. Mm -hmm. Um, Something about like the political discourse nowadays has made a big difference, I think, for people. Yeah. And also just people have had tough conversations 
mm-hmm. with their friends, their family. You know, I think that I agree. I'm looking forward to reading that hopefully. And, you know, I, I was just having a conversation with a friend the other day that I don't know if the friendship just, it changed it during all of that. And they had some tough conversations. And I think a lot of people went through that and hopefully came out better on the other side. Yeah. Changed in ways that then kind of infiltrate other parts of life. Mm-hmm. All right. right. Well, this has been a really great chat. We really like love all your insights and we're so excited to watch the new season of the show. So if you could tell everybody the premiere date, where they can find your work, we would love that. Yes. Our show is dropping on Friday, the 28th, I believe, uh, on time. And I know the producers wanted us also to mention if people want to work with me on the show, how to get in touch with us. So if anybody wants to work with you on potential future seasons of the show, they can apply at CouplesTherapyDocumentary.com. Thank you. (laughs) We got it for you. (laughs) This will be out ahead of the show, um, and this will give people a good opportunity to watch the first three seasons, check up on your work, read anything you've written, and then uh, they can catch the premiere date shortly thereafter. Can't wait. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. (laughs) Very fun, engaging interview. I really appreciated it. We thought so, too. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Well, we hope you all enjoyed that interview and you can find us at girlsgottoeat.com. Tickets available next week, Monday the 17th, but you can start saving the day now and getting excited. Uh, so girlsgottoeat.com will be where you can get tour tickets for the entire Snack City Tour, Girls Gotta Eat podcast on both Instagram and TikTok. I am Ash Hess. Raina is Raina.Greenberg on Instagram. Subscribe on YouTube. Check out our sex toy line and our erotic audio app at vibesonly.com and vibes only on Instagram and we'll see you next week. Have a week, guys. Bye.